Well, that is the essence of this first prophecy of Jeremiah, found here in chapters 2 and 3. Let us then look, in it, look at it in a little more detail. Jeremiah chapter 2. First of all, he begins by confronting the people of his day with their sinful condition. But he begins by reminding them in verses 1 to 3 of their past. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. He's speaking about the time of the exodus from Egypt. Even at that time, of course, Israel was far from being sinless. But by comparison with the state of the nation in Jeremiah's day, the people at the time of the exodus were faithful to God. They responded to God's call to leave Egypt. They followed Moses out into the barren wilderness, a land with no natural means to support them. And their willingness to do this was rewarded because God provided for them. And there in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, Israel was set apart for God. At Sinai, God made a covenant with the nation, taking them to be his holy nation and he to be their God. And the people committed themselves to keep God's covenant. They committed themselves to live in obedience to his laws and they experienced the goodness of God protecting them from their enemies. Those who attempted to harm them soon discovered that Israel was under the special protection of God. Now, why is the prophet reminding them of these things? Well, sadly, he is reminding them of these things in order to highlight the contrast between then and now. Because the people are no longer like that. They have become a disobedient, rebellious nation, forgetting their special relationship with God and going after the false gods of the nations. It is a sad story. I wonder if there is anyone here this morning and in essence, that is your story. I wonder if there is someone here this morning and you can look back to a time when you became a Christian and you walked faithfully with God and you experienced the goodness and the grace of God, but that was a long time ago. And since then, you've become like these people. You have forgotten your God. You have forgotten your Savior. And you have gone after things that do not profit. If there is anyone here in that condition this morning, I plead with you this morning, pay attention to the Word of God. Return even today to your Lord and to your Savior. Well, having reminded them of the past, he now challenges them about the present in verses 4 to 8, what they are today. He says, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, what injustice or unrighteousness have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me, have followed idols and have become idolaters? Has God given them any cause to abandon him? Has God failed them? Has his promise failed? No! And yet they have abandoned him and followed idols. Verse 6, they have not sought the Lord who helped them in the past. 
They've not sought the God who led them into the promised land and gave them so much blessing. And indeed, in the promised land, they have defiled it. Their priests have not sought God. The teacher of the law of the law didn't know God. The civil rulers transgressed the laws of God. The so-called prophets didn't have the word of God. And they spoke in the name of false gods and led the people astray. And the prophet is contrasting the sad condition of the present day with the condition of the past when they heard God's word and followed Moses out into the wilderness. In verses 9 to 13, he says, Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you. And first of all, he charges them with this, that their behavior has been worse than that of other nations. He says the other nations, they worship false gods. But they're faithful to their own gods. They do not abandon their gods. But my people, my people of Israel have changed their glory. That is to say the living and the true God, they have changed the living God for something worthless. It is utterly shocking and appalling. Verse 12, be astonished, O heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. And then in verse 13, he says, my people have committed two evils. Here are the two principal evils of the people. First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and secondly, they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. They have forsaken the source of life, and they have turned aside to devices of their own doing, which are completely useless. In verses 14 to 19, he points to the judgments that they have brought upon themselves. The nation has been plundered, the land has been devastated, the cities have been burned and depopulated. Why have these things happening? He asks, is Israel a mere slave? No, God has said of Israel, Israel is my firstborn son. How then can this happen? And there is only one answer. The people have brought it upon themselves. It is not that God has failed them, but that they are experiencing God's judgment. They are experiencing the inevitable consequences of their own turning away from God. And he challenges them to face up to the reality of their behavior. Verse 23, how can you say I am not polluted? I have not gone after the bales. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. The evidence is there for you to look back and to see how can you deny your guilty behavior. And yet they continue in their sin and pretend that all is well. And so he goes on. And there is so much here concerning the sinfulness of man. Well, what does this have to say to us today? First of all, we have to recognize that what he is describing is the behavior of the people of Jerusalem and Judah two and a half millennia ago. And we are not Israelites. We don't belong to the covenant nation. We were not among those delivered from the land of Egypt, taken into the land of promise and so on. 
and we cannot apply directly